Thank you, Mary. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey. Whatever. That's because we did a tech check at 11 a.m. I'm so paranoid about technology. I teach a class every fall with 400 kids uh, about the size of this room, and uh, something always goes wrong. So um, I'm thrilled to be here and to get to talk to this incredible group of people especially because I feel like you all are on the front line of one of the most important conversations that's ever taken place in the United States, which is really about the future of this great set of institutions of higher education that we've built and how we can make them the true front door to the middle class that they have always been before. And we're falling behind and we've got to catch up. So when I look at the institutions that are represented here today, I got so excited because I really feel like you all are the ones who are going to make it happen. Uh, schools that take 500 or 1,000 or uh, 600 students a year are important, but not the same way as the students, as the publics that are taking tens of thousands of students. And the privates that are reaching out to underserved groups in our population. So it's a real thrill to be here. And I also want to tip my hat to Tulane. They've been doing great work for a long time. And the honor that they received is very, very, very well deserved. So, and the clerk works, too. That's great. So, you know, starting off, just a word to remind us all that the institution of the university is um, one of the most enduring institutions um, in our world. That, interestingly, of the 85 institutions that existed in 1550, 1550 and still exist, British Parliament, Roman Catholic Church, of the 85, 70 are universities. 70 of the 85. So if you're talking about, in the parlance of venture capital, runway, how long is the runway? How long are, how enduring? Uh, the runway is long. These institutions must be doing something right because they've been around a long time, and the odds are they're gonna be around a long time. So if you're gonna take a bet right now, what would, uh, in 100 years, let's say 100 years, is it more likely that Pick a school. Uh, West, University of West Virginia. <laughs> Paula, right there. What's more likely, University of West Virginia exists or Google exists? I bet on West Virginia. So these institutions are important. They're difficult. They're hard to change. We're going to talk about all that. But I wanted to start by reminding us all that they're enduring. And there, there's a long runway, and they're worth investing in because they're going to be here. I would just put a period right there. They're going to be here. OK. So having said that, we've probably never been more under siege than we are now. And interestingly, what the press writes about there are probably not, are not the big issues that we're facing. I mean, is it worth it? Hell yeah, it's worth it. Any, by any measure, a college degree is worth it. It's somewhere between 50 and 100% increase in earning power. Uh, there, it, it's not even close. Uh, and yet, I mean, it's talked a lot about it, a lot in the press, and written about, but there's no question that it's worth it if you go to a good school or, and if you finish, and the, which is a really big deal. What's, it's not worth it to go and not finish. In fact, you're worse off if you go and don't finish. But if you can, you're maybe worth off, worse off if you're going to some for-profit school that's uh, really not uh, particularly uh, effective. And I think we're seeing the marketplace now work and the for-profit sector shrink because they haven't uh, delivered. But it's definitely worth it. The whole thing, the other big issue is student debt, and as we all know, it's probably a little overblown as well. The average student debt is 
around $14,000, that uh, about 70% of the student debt is under $25,000. Um, and yes, there are problems with, with student debt, and there are individuals that have way too much. Most of that came from the for-profit sector. So student debt is an issue, but it's probably not the, it's not the fundamental issue. And tuition increases get written about a lot, but the reality is that 70% 70, 70 of the schools in the United States, the yield on tuition is down over the last five years. Even though you read about tuition going up because of all the discounting and all the other issues surrounding tuition. So, but I will say, I think we all know the days of unfettered tuition increases are over. I mean, that little trick is about done. And it's a little bit like heroin that you have to wean yourself from. But I think we're all going to have to wean ourselves from continuing to increase tuition. The public backlash is such that that's probably not sustainable. OK. Those aren't the big problems. Now I want to talk to you about what I think are the big problems. And of course, as entrepreneurs, we always look at those problems as opportunities. So it's demographics, arithmetic, and technology. Demographics, arithmetic, and technology. So the demographic, this is a great chart. It's all over the place now. Um, I think uh, the Gates Foundation published it most recently. And it's very eye-opening in terms of what the, it's a bit of an eye chart which I uh, apologize for. But I mean, some of the things that are just astonishing are the fact that uh, fully a third of all college students are over 30. That uh, you'll see uh, racially, we're still not doing very well, but 26% uh, have children. Uh, like 80% are under have financial aid of some sort. Uh, the bottom line is the demographics of college students today are not the old days of you know upper middle class white kid that's often people think of when they think of college. Um, and the fact is it's going to change even more so. Um, when you look at the workforce and where it will be even by 2020, uh, California and Texas will be majority non-white. 2020. Uh, it's shifting to the West and the Southwest in terms of just trends, where the people are. Uh, so the bottom line uh, is that we are going to uh, have a big challenge to match our skills and our institutions with the demographic that's coming along. It's not that there are too many colleges, because Frankly, we're falling behind in terms of college education. We're 20th in the world, which is scandalous, just in terms of uh, a percent of our population with college education. But um, we are seeing these huge demographic shifts, and schools are going to have to adjust to those shifts. Um, and also, we'll have an opportunity to change and uh, for the better as a result of the ch shifts. Okay, arithmetic is pretty grim. Between a third and a half of all college uh, higher education institutions have an unsustainable business model. Between a third and a half. It's probably a half. And it might be higher than a half because um, college leaders don't like to talk about it, but there a recent study of the chief financial officers of, of uh, colleges and universities. It's like 70% think they're about, will soon face a major financial crisis. So the CFOs, who uh, admittedly are paid to provide bad news, they're supposed to be conservative, uh, but are more, probably a little more realistic than leaders who don't really want to tell alumni or boards how serious the problem really is. But the arithmetic is daunting. 
And the odds are that if you're in higher education for a decade between now and the next decade, you'll be involved in some sort of financial crisis. It's not all bad, and I'll get to that. Because again, crisis is what often creates change, and uh, often change for the better. And the third technology, the third big problem that I think we're all faced with is technology and how to use it. So, you know, we, the, the MOOCs came along and went, but nevertheless taught us all a big message. We taught, Holden and I taught a MOOC, and we had 40,000 students uh, from all over the world, and we were just awestruck. Uh, there, were form, there were like 800 forums. You know, we would go in and talk on the forums and talk to people from Afghanistan and Poland and Costa Rica and Brazil. It was called What's Your Big Idea? And it was very exciting. But what turned out to be the case is that there were lots of lessons and materials that, from the MOOC that we could use in the classroom. And as it turns out now with research, it's begin we're beginning to learn the, at least the flip classroom where we use technology to do some of the lecturing outside of class before and use the classroom for other purposes is actually better, not just more efficient, is actually better education than strict, the strictly lecture method. So honestly, the lecture is like the newspaper. I mean, it's, it's not going to be the model that's sustainable over a long period of time. And one of the big problems with it is it's not scalable. It fits into what uh, Professor Baumel calls the, calls the cost disease. It's like a symphony orchestra. If you want to make it bigger, you have to hire another violinist. You aren't getting any economies of scale in a symphony orchestra. And the strict lecture model is the same deal. But if we're going to be, hey, uh, in some ways, doing less with more, reaching more students, and reaching them where they belong, uh, where they, in the ways that they learn, we're gonna have to have another look at technology and continue to use technology in a much more uh, effective way. You know, pe uh, kids don't buy albums anymore, they buy songs. And I think that that's probably an analogy to the old lecture and how we've got to begin to think about different ways of teaching that fit more to the songs than to the albums. It's an opportunity. So, with all these, what I think are daunting problems, entrepreneurs love this, because entrepreneurs are attracted to problems as big institutions aren't. Entrepreneurs are attracted to change the way moths are attracted to light. They're attracted to change the way moths, because they know that big institutions do very badly with change, and that entrepreneurial opportunities grow out of the fact and it's hard for big institutions to change. However, we suggest in our book, and I suggest to you today, that entrepreneurial thinking is both needed and uh, an exciting opportunity on university campuses. Uh, in large part, because entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial thinking, as we understand it, is not about starting businesses. It's about a way of thinking that combines uh, innovation and execution. So big ideas are great and frankly we often have big ideas on our campuses. But execution sometimes not so much. We're often not nearly as good at executing as we are at thinking of big ideas. And you hear about them and then a year or two later you hear about them again and then you hear about them again and it doesn't happen. So entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial thinking is one way of beginning to translate in a much more effective way big ideas that occur in college campuses and also big challenges that we're being faced with, uh, thinking about them not as problems but as opportunities. However, the next big question is, so, but how do you do that? How do you do that on a campus? How does a campus become more entrepreneurial and introduce an entrepreneurial mindset to you know, not only to a school, or not only to a group of students, but to a whole campus. So, we have a few ideas. I'll throw out a few ideas for you. The first thing is to open the tent. And uh, by that I mean to invite entrepreneurs to join you on your 
in your community on some basis. Now, the term entrepreneur residence is getting used a lot as a way of doing that. Uh, sometimes it's professor of practice. Often these people are part-time people who spend some time on campus, continue to do their entrepreneurial stuff. Um, they have Rolodexes, they have short attention spans, and they're not good at following instructions. <laughs> so, you, so there are pluses and minuses. And, and if you're in a hierarchical top-down, they can look like problems. But if you can tolerate uh, the, the mindset, they can have a huge impact. And at Chapel Hill, there may be 20 or 25 of them running around. And they do great things. Uh, they drive people crazy. But they do do great things. And they, one way to begin to develop a mindset, an entrepreneurial mindset on a campus, is to get some entrepreneurs on campus on some basis. And that requires faculty to swallow hard and say, OK, this professor of the practice has a terminal degree, but he doesn't have a PhD. And the fact of the matter is, uh, I work next door here for a number of years, literally next door, the building next door. Uh, as the CEO of Information America, I have a law degree and I have an undergraduate degree. I happen to have a master's in education, but I'm not an academic. And uh, Chapel Hill was kind enough to welcome me back. And uh, my partnership with Holden Thorpe and then many, many other people joining us I think has been able to impact the culture, but getting entrepreneurs running around the campus is an important, um, important. The second thing that's important, in fact critical, is to broaden the definition of what we're talking about. Because typically, your faculty colleagues will say, what you're talking about is getting a bunch of white males to come to campus and run this place like a business, and we're not interested. And that's what happened in Chapel Hill when we first came. So the first person we invited was a social entrepreneur named Bill Drake, who started, anybody heard of Bill Drake? Started the Ashoka Foundation. He was our first speaker. And our sociology, the chair of sociology loved him to death, but wanted nothing to do with entrepreneurship. And he explained to her that entrepreneurship could be social entrepreneurship. And there are lots of different ways to define it, but it's a critical if you're going to get any kind of movement on your campus to broaden the definition. And the best way to do it is to bring in an artistic entrepreneur or a social entrepreneur or some or here's a picture of Muhammad Yunus who we had on campus who invented micro lending. There's so many different angles here, but you can't make this about business or you'll be stuck in the business. And you will not change the culture of your campus. The third thing, I can't say enough about this, is to develop a strategy. And it's almost impossible to have a strategy in academia because, because no one wants to make the hard choices. Because strategy is not so much what to do, but what not to do. And no one wants to not do something. And no one wants to have a winner and a loser. Uh, i.e., if we do this, then we can't do that, and the chair of that department is going to be very upset. We're a community, we're, we've been, we're based on consensus, and as one faculty member said to me, consensus is the uh, enemy of strategy. You can't make everybody happy. So, the reality is, you can do a strategy deal, but it's going to be like everybody else's strategy, and it's not really going to make a difference unless there's either a crisis. And don't worry, because that arithmetic I told you says that for many of us, the crisis is coming. Uh, or a vision. And you know the crisis and what happened there, um, we could all uh, look at Sweetbriar, and they rocked along, and they said they had a strategy, and they kept losing money, and finally they said they were going to close down. And that was the crisis. And Sweetbriar is still open because there was a crisis. Okay, those crises are coming uh, more than we would like. The good news is that if you get ahead of the game and you have a vision, that also can drive 
a strategy. And I, the example I'd give you is Michael Crow at Arizona State. He said, we want to be judged by who we accept, not who we reject. That was his vision. We as a school want to be uh, accept, uh, judged by the people we take, not by the people we turn down. That drove everything, 50 to 90,000 in enrollment, very entrepreneurial place, very controversial place, but a very simple mission that drove a strategy, and that at least gets you ahead of the game instead of waiting for the arithmetic crisis to come, which if you don't do something about strategy, will get you. And the last thing about becoming more entrepreneurial is culture, not structure. This isn't about creating a department. This is about creating a mindset. A mindset on campus that says, yes, we can. Well, <laughs> or something like that. Not, yes, I, I, can, I can fix this, but. Um, <laughs> oh, well. Um, <laughs> but uh, you can create a culture. And the culture is one that does accept ideas that's willing tolerate failure, but the F word in academia is not well accepted. Failure. But you can't be entrepreneurial and get it right every time. So you start small, under the radar, try stuff, some works, some doesn't work, and the key is that you've got to have support from the top, whether it's Gordon Gee at West Virginia, my colleague Holden at Thorpe at UNC, who was an entrepreneur, created a culture that allowed people to try stuff and fail. That's the key, and that's what's really, really important. However, and this is the yes but. You know, we wrote this book, and it's been around six or seven years, and it does say we need to be more entrepreneurial. But people said, this is great. We love your book. We agree with you. Universities need to be run more like businesses. And we said, huh? <laughs> We didn't say that. We didn't write about that. That's not what we think. We think universities need to think more entrepreneurially, but we cannot, we cannot throw out the baby with the bad one. Universities are special. It is a higher calling. You're all here for that reason. If you weren't, you'd be working for some company. If I weren't, I'd be next door where my office was for, the, for 15 years. And I'm not there. I'm in Chapel Hill because I think we all have a higher cause. So, in a way, the universities are like a secular religion. And it, pardon me for this old well at Chapel Hill, but you know, freshmen drink out of the old well on the first day because they think it makes them get good grades. Um, they didn't when I was there, but they do it now. They line up. I'm kind of nuts. And everybody gets their picture taken at graduation. And most schools have the equivalent of that. There is something beyond. And that's not a, you don't see that in a company or anywhere else. And we, and look, I have to like you, Ty. Um, there's something special about a university. We're trying to get our arms around this because honestly, uh, secret, we're writing a second book called Higher Call. And it's, we're trying to get our arms around, even as we speak, what is all the things that make universities so special? Uh, C.S. Lewis said that they're a society in pursuit of learning. They're, that there are some sort of community, okay? We are a community of some sort, not just a factory and not a corporation. So the first point I want to make in relation to that is the universities are not a business. And to prove that, you can take 10 different case studies of schools that said, we're going to get the CEO of Domino's Pizza in here, and they're going to straighten this thing out, and we're going to get everything sort of going the way it should be. Uniform disaster. Every attempt to try to run a university like a business turns out to be a disaster. So you can be entrepreneurial, but you can't, this is not a business. This is not a business. And students actually are not customers. And I have to say that I fell into this myself. When I first came back to Chapel Hill, I said, we need to listen to the customer. We need to listen to the customer. 
And we do need to listen to students. Prospective students, we need to adjust to the needs of students. But that's different than a transaction where a student pays a certain amount of money and you guarantee them you know, a certain income. That's not, in my view, what universities are about. Uh, and I think we have to push back on that uh, now because there is a huge, the same people who love our book, and honestly, we felt like it's Great as it is, everyone's embracing entrepreneurship. There are days when we said we created a monster because we students are not customers. They they uh, they are prospective members of our community at the beginning. They're applicants. They turn into learners and members of our community, uh, peers in some ways. Because some of our students help us with research and all the rest. They become alumni. They are members of our community. But it's very important, I think, that we all understand that we have a responsibility not to always do what the customer wants, but rather to get the customer an education. And not only a vocation, but an education. And to push back on the idea that we're simply uh, a trade school. Equally important, faculty are not just employees. And this is something that I think board members of schools learn after they become board members. And they, <laughs> unfortunately, they don't usually get it. And then suddenly they realize, sorry, the autonomy, the importance of the autonomy of professors. This happens to be our Nobel Prize winner, Aziz Sankar, who's definitely not an employee. Um, he uh, has his own lab, obviously. He, no one tells him um, what to teach. No one tells him what grade to give. And uh, we all sit in front of our computer and give a grade, which is arguably one of the most important things that happens on a college campus. And no board of trustees or supervisor or anybody else is between you and that, that um, act. So it's very important to not lose that as well, that we, uh, that the faculty are the keepers of the souls of the university, in our view, that they uh, create the norms of the community. We, there are a lot of issues about part-time faculty and non-tenure track and all the rest, and some of the people that get hired may be more like employees, but the core faculty of a university, if it really is a university, is the faculty, and they get up and walk out, and they don't have to come back. They can go somewhere else. And we need to understand that that is a complex relationship, and in fact, much more like a partnership than an employer-employee relationship. And it's another thing that we're going to have to push back on now, because a lot of people don't get it. And the last thing I want to say about all of this right now, and again, this is in process. We're literally working our way through these issues, even as we speak, is that, you know, it's not just about how much money you make. And the idea that a school should be ranked based on the earnings of their alumni uh, is, I think, unfortunate. Now, I think. Alumni, we should prepare people to get jobs. And we should probably be, do better. I mean, I think we, we as faculty have to meet people halfway here. And that means we probably have to be a little more, uh, either better ourselves or have partnerships with others, can, especially that first job. You know, I think we probably do, in general, better preparing people for their last job than for their first job. Um, some big decisions where history maybe is important in English and you have to write a speech and you have to talk fluently, but sometimes getting that first job is tough and I think we're not equipped personally to help students necessarily with the skills for that first job and I think we've got to be, uh, be clear-eyed about the fact that the public and parents and students themselves uh, want skills that will help them get that first job and if we can help them with that, then the rest of the education, I think, will help them 
propel them beyond the will of God. So those are some thoughts that I would encourage uh, as part of the discussion of the book tomorrow. Because those are the sort of postscript on engines of innovation, which is yes, entrepreneurial thinking is important, but yes, universities as they exist are important and we need to sustain the values. And the reason we do, and this is what I want to leave you with, and then leave some time for questions, is that I believe that you all and the institutions that you represent are the engines of our chief engines of social mobility in this country right now. And we have never, never been in a situation where that is more important than it is right now. That social mobility has stalled, uh, inequality has increased. Almost everyone, no matter where on the political spectrum, has now embraced the fact that we've got to do better. And yet, when you start thinking about how are we going to do better, a college education is still the single biggest ticket to social mobility. We're not particularly well positioned right now to assume that responsibility. We're going to have to change. And entrepreneurial thinking will be in the forefront in getting us to start thinking better about how higher college. And I honestly believe that higher calling, which I hope and believe you all embrace, will require great innovation and great entrepreneurship. But God knows it's worth it, because if this American experiment is to continue, then we've got to pull our weight in terms of our role in uh, expanding the middle class and making this country what it set out to be and what we all know it can be. So thanks for your time, and we've got a time for a few questions, but I very much uh, am honored to be part of this, and want and hope this is the beginning of a conversation, not only here, but elsewhere when you go back. And Holden and I are committed to traveling the country and talking with you all and your campuses and others like Michael Crow and Jonathan Cole about how we can fulfill this incredible mission that we are all um, embarked upon. So thank you. So we've got time for a few questions, just a few. I have to go to a wedding in Milwaukee. <laughs> Believe it or not. Anyone from Milwaukee? We're going to Milwaukee. The wedding is, we're supposed to be there tonight, and we, so I would love to be here for a, a long time to talk to all of you, which I can't do. But it's a good, for a good reason. But if, uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Are there? Yes. So I'm sure you're familiar with like, Christensen. I am. Yeah. So you're talking about this experiment. So I think the key is to what we is come to be known as the minimally viable product, MVP, is to try stuff, and here's the tough part, try stuff under the radar. And the problem is, if you come up with a good idea, your president wants to go tell the whole world about it before it's even ready, before it's even half-baked. And then if it doesn't work out, you're in the spotlight. But so the, in my view, the way to really get innovation is to try a lot of stuff under the radar to make it possible not to start a department because when you start a department then you can't ever kill it and it doesn't work. <laughs> so it's really, really, at a university. So it's really important to have the uh, ability to try things out uh, provisionally. And whether that's sunsetting things, it's here for three years but unless it's reauthorized it goes away. I mean, there are a lot of tricks to do that. The best thing is just under promise and over perform. To just try things out. Not a little bit of money can go a long way when you're trying things out. Don't be grandiose. Um, 
But yeah, MVP, minimally viable product. And there's something called the business model canvas, which we borrow from business, but it's not just about business. And it's, uh, it's uh, the idea is something called lean startup. And it's you try to get something going really fast, and the adage is you fail quickly, inexpensively, and often, and as a result, you work your way up to what the right answer is. Yes, other. Yes. So you mentioned the fact that the entrepreneurial ethos can be kind of a six trouble maker or something. Yes. Um, and so how do you steer entrepreneurs so that the things they're working on are actually important so there's a viable and value proposition? Because entrepreneurs, I think, are ready to fill any niche. Right? Yes. So they may be ready to you know, put like an ice cream stand at every poke stop on the right. <laughs> Okay, so some of this is about what I call meeting people halfway. So you, yes, it's important to have entrepreneurs on campus, but maybe not an ice cream stand entrepreneur. Um, and so entrepreneurs, the right entrepreneurs need to respect the university or the college and higher education and want to be there. And by the way, there are plenty of them in your alumni base who would love to be asked to come back and help. And they're cool. I'm not just ice cream sticks. The other challenge is faculty who are willing to meet them halfway and actually talk to these people because for whatever reason, maybe because they just are nervous about it or maybe for our ideological, can't meet them halfway. So the key is finding some entrepreneurs who can meet them half, us halfway on the campus and some faculty who are willing and comfortable enough to meet the entrepreneurs halfway. So, I have pained expressions, and I'm not going to miss this airplane, or I'm in big trouble. I can't thank you enough. I love being here, and God bless all of you.